Uh, welcome all of you to panel two, which is looking at the integration of maritime forces into inter-organizational efforts in a competitive space. Now, as Peter Roberts already mentioned, that the United Kingdom launched the integrated operating concept in September of 2020, which identifies the need for the UK armed forces to do more in the space before major warfare, what it terms war fighting. The concept places emphasis on how militaries operate in what it terms as the engage and constrain space, and in particular, a focus on how to integrate across government, as Admiral Kidd mentioned at his keynote. Now, arguably, navies are, are the most versed of all of the services in operating in the engage mode, combining with other agencies to deliver national interest. Ship visits, I hesitate to say cocktail parties, uh, presence, uh, posturing off the coast, and of course, kinetic capabilities as well, which moves beyond engage into constrain and fight. This panel is going to consider how navies can capitalize on that expertise they have and how they can operate in constraining competitors. It will look into how navies can add value to groups such as special forces and non-military organizations to create persistently engaged joint forces that become more than the sum of their individual parts. And we have three fantastic panelists in Linda Robinson, Colonel Simon Rogers, and Professor Nina Kolas. Linda is the Director of the Centre for Middle East Public Policy at RAND. She specialises in special operations, stabilisation and information operations, as well as Middle East and South Asia issues. Amongst a number of publications, she co-authored Modern Political Warfare, Current Practices and Possible Responses in a piece of work for RAND. She's a visiting fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, John Hopkins, the Wilson Center, and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. She is eminently qualified to speak on how a whole of government approach is needed to respond to the threats we're facing that were so ably brought out in the first panel. And also, she'll then turn to consider what that means for the military, in particular, considering the challenges of combined operations and special operation forces adaptation to regular warfare, which again, Professor Corbett nicely trailed in his remarks in the previous panel. Linda will then hand over to Simon, who will pick up on that theme. As the Assistant Chief of Staff for Maritime Special Operations in the Royal Navy, he'll bring Linda's broad overview into the maritime domain. He's ideally placed to do that, having served in the Royal Marines for over 20 years and has a hugely impressive operational pedigree, including maritime interdiction operations, training missions. He deployed to the Al Four Peninsula in 2003 and has done operational tours in Belfast, Afghanistan, Northwest Africa and the Levant. As a commanding officer of 4-0 Commando, he was responsible for developing and delivering the future Commando Force transformation. And in his new role, he's responsible for developing maritime special operations for the Royal Navy. Who better then to look at UK plans for maritime special operation forces and consider some of the capabilities that they'll need. But as we heard from Professor Holmes, our capabilities are increasingly challenged in the cyber domain. And Nina is going to look at those challenges and the threats to our capabilities through this area. And in light of those challenges, how important is it that armed forces are integrated across other parties in government which neatly will bring this panel full circle and ready for your questions. Nina is an Associate Professor in Cyber and Innovation Policy at the Naval War College. Her PhD from the Ohio State University is in Political Science, and she's a Senior Adjunct Scholar at the Center for New American Security, a Fellow at the Brute Krulak Center at Marine Corps University, an Executive Board Member of the Cyber Conflict Studies Association, and an editorial board member of the Texas National Security Review. She publishes on cybersecurity, hackers, and military innovation, so is perfectly placed to round off our panel. Uh, it's also a great pity there isn't a break after this panel because at the topic of her, ha her hacker project at DEF CON 27 was confessions of a Nespresso money mule, but you'll have to wait until after panel three for the, the coffee, I'm afraid. Each of our speakers will speak for about five to 10 minutes and 
Linda will pass on to Simon, who will then pass on to Nina, and then we'll throw it open for Q&A. Uh, I should remind you that the presentations are on the record, but the Q&A will be off the record. Thank you very much. And Linda, if I can pass over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Paul. And it's always a pleasure to participate in Brucey Convenings. In fact, my last trip abroad was to your Information Maneuver Conference about a year ago. Today, I will offer a view from across the pond on the need to integrate in response to the dominant challenge of the times, interstate competition with the spectrum of activities as described in your integrated operating concept. I'll briefly address four dimensions of the whole of government aspect allied interagency and joint integration and some brief remarks on soft adaptation uh, on the US side. If I may start, and thank you for referencing the modern political warfare uh, study we published in 2018. Uh, the case studies that we analyzed as part of that produced a description of this uh, phenomenon of competition uh, with many of the same attributes that are noted in the integrated operating concept. I'd like to just very briefly call out four, and perhaps principally, first of all, that it's predominantly a non-military phenomenon with political, economic information and cyber activities acting across the seams and vulnerabilities of a society, state, or alliance in order to gain advantage or win without fighting. We found that information and cyber are particularly potent in the contemporary practice of what we called political warfare per George Kennan. Uh, I would note with terminology having now settled on competition, um, I think that the integrated operating concept has done a fine job of making the case that this is a can be a non benign form of competition uh, that requires states and societies to compete in order to deny that adversary advantage or even uh, to win. I think in, in extreme cases, at least, it's helpful for the friendly side to set a goal also of winning without fighting on our own terms and values. Uh, in part, this is because this is warfare in the adversary's view, though it is not a war fight as the West understands it. It is rather an idea of disarticulating or immobilizing the adversary, undoing it from within without musket shots necessarily being fired. So my first observation is that governments are still working to understand exactly what threshold, sub-threshold competition is, and to organize to detect and gauge its level and aims. The government's, U.S. government's analytic power, in my view, is not focused on this. One of the fronts that RAND has been working on since our 2018 study is developing a model to systematically scan and analyze large volumes of extant data data in order to uh, serve this central mission of understanding. Uh, there are efforts uh, underway to organize our, our government, the US government better, uh, to respond and engage in competition. One document I would like to reference is the Irregular Warfare Annex to the National Defense Strategy. It places great emphasis on joint and interagency integration, as well as allied and partner roles. It attempts to move thinking away from the idea that irregular warfare is what SOF does, while the conventional forces can conduct deterrence and fight the big wars. Uh, the words here do get in the way. Uh, irregular warfare has um, a doctrinal definition in US military doctrine. Um, but I think for the purpose of this discussion, it's I'm trying to highlight the fact that the document is really about organizing the government to compete in this threshold, sub-threshold arena. I now would like to make several brief observations, an informal report card, if you will, on the progress that I see is that is being made. Um, and first, uh, I would like to make a reference to allied integration during Operation Inherent Resolve. I think that this um, coalition effort uh, to defeat the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria was an enormous success with relevance to this competition. Um, uh, area. The allies did more than the US numerically and the partners in the region did the actual fighting. I believe we should think about how that example can be built upon. I'm also taken by the chief of defense's phrase, 
quote, allied by design. I take that as a bold call to structure ourselves very deliberately for the challenges across several regions. And I might um, hazard a guess that this can mean possibly new standing structures, more habitual or robust exchange of personnel, and overcoming the more episodic activations that we've seen of the past 20 years. Returning now to what I see inside the US government as uh, that is where I mostly focus. Regarding interagency uh, integration, um, there is, as I noted in this irregular warfare annex, a very um, strong emphasis on the th authorities and competencies that were reside in our non-military departments and agencies to include Treasury, law enforcement organizations, and the Coast Guard. Another central actor is the State Department, but it needs to be designated as such and to rebuild and retool to perform its role in this spectrum. The country team the, uh, is the integrating cross-functional field entity. It's headed by the U.S. ambassador, who's the president's personal representative. Uh, in, in my view, it should also be an integrator at the departmental level. However, we have to acknowledge that now we've had a very severe loss of the most senior foreign service career ambassadors. Many ambassador, ambassador posts have been vacant over the past years. I want to note one very interesting development, which is Bill Burns' uh, nomination to be the director of CIA, which in itself uh, is an innovative and integrative act, given his long career in the foreign service. Finally, I think the... Um, critical action uh, to be taken is in the crafting of the national security strategy, not the national defense strategy, but the whole of government security strategy. And this document must say much more about the non-military roles and the organizational structure, the scheme needed to enable integrated action. This must be a detailed overarching strategy that articulates non-military roles so that the military will understand precisely how to plug into it and support it. Now I will make three observations about the joint uh, military status. Um, I think the, co the constrained description in the integrated operating concept uh, makes clear uh, the critical part, the competition, while it may be largely non-kinetic, at the th sub threshold arena, there will still be some action by intelligence, covert or overt forces to deter by coercion, positioning and denial. The US uh, military's ability to conduct a spectrum of activities in this th sub threshold arena is something of a mixed bag in my view. While it hasn't in invested in interoperability and building partner uh, capacity and some soft uh, activities, capabilities such as civil affairs, information and support actions, I would highlight in particular that psychological operations forces in the US Army particularly are chronically severely underdeveloped, underfunded and undereducated. Second point is that investment is now being made in critical emergent uh, requirements for operating in the peer uh, environment, most prominently cyber, which Nina will have much more to say about, and the electromagnetic spectrum activities, which we've had a taste of around the world, but for land forces uh, in the Ukraine, Syria, and elsewhere. I see two issues as impeding progress. One is that adaptation to date is largely focused above the threshold and less on sub-threshold requirements. Second, there is insufficient emphasis on developing common systems. A, as the IOC puts it, a shared digital backbone for sensing and combined action. The culprit in the US at least is well known and that is service-based acquisition. And it's been complicated to some degree by a one-off use of the other transaction authority. And this is for short-term uh, contracting. I noted uh, this month that the French have uh, procured or announced the procurement of a joint tactical signals intelligence system for portable and vehicle mounted uh, electromagnetic magnetic sensing and EW. And this, I think, is uh, a very 
good example of what right looks like as this system will serve tactical units, including the Army Signal Regiment, Navy warships, and maritime patrol aircraft, and to include air bases. The US services are adapting in concept and experimentation and training, but there are significant material gaps, as I've noted, especially in, in the case of the Army, which has been very focused on counterinsurgency and actually divested electronic support capacity. Uh, the Navy and the Marine Corps are readier in some respects because, for example, the Navy has been uh, for long, uh, forever focused on uh, freedom uh, of navigation, global commons, projection, protection, uh, and uh, other missions that are core uh, to what it has done and what it will need to do. The Marine Corps is uh, a, a, an agile small force that's always ready to uh, reinvent itself. And I think the current commandant is uh, to be commended for his out of the box thinking. I'll make a last few comments briefly about US special operations forces. They're still very much in the process of finding the way to balance the legacy counterterrorism mission with new competition missions, which are largely still undefined, uh, but will be uh, essentially about sensing and about enabling follow on operations. Rand has been asked to offer some ideas about new organizational models and the training and equipping implications. And I'll, I'll close with noting that the Air Force Special Operations Commander, Lieutenant General Jim Slife, gave a speech this month at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, uh, which which um, repeated some of what he told us last year uh, with some of his usually pungent comments. Um, he, he started by comparing that we are in a moment, a current inflection point similar to 9-11 in terms of the magnitude of the shift uh, in, in the current environment. He emphasized, as he has been since he took a command of the Air Force component of SOF, that its future uh, it, it must be different. So in order to be different, it must stop doing some things and stop maintaining all 20 some platforms it currently operates since its budget is not going up. Uh, he foresees a closer tie in to the US Air Force. And I think that will be true of all services, uh, tighter linkage of services, conventional forces and soft. And he closed by saying that he would prefer rather than sit sitting around thinking big thoughts about teleportation machines and, in and invisibility cloaks, that the current task is to make his C-130 invisible at a critical moment in time. And I think that that is, um, the task in front of soft right now uh, to think about how it can take what it has, reorganize, add new capabilities that are non soft capabilities and uh, aim to survive and operate in very difficult settings. So thank you. With, with that, I'll turn it over to Simon. Thank you. Linda, thank you very much. And uh, quite right that Simon comes in in light of the challenge you've just laid down in terms of how special operation forces need to think about the future. So Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Linda. Good afternoon. Um, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm really pleased to be able to contribute to such a rich and important discussion. I'll quickly paint what a maritime special operation is and then move on to why and how they're making a resurgence in the Royal Navy. Uh, next slide, please, Sabrina. So what are they? The doctrinal definition for special operations tend to be characteristics based. So fundamentally, however, special operations are defined by what they are not. What they are not are operations that the conventional force can do on its own routinely. They scratch certain itches the general purpose force cannot reach. For example, dam busters was a special operation, Dresden was not. The sinking of the Tirpitz and the associated raid on St. Nazir were a series of special operations. The sinking of the Bismarck was not. So the special operation is the purpose and soft is just the tool for the job. Special operations can therefore be defined as normal activity in unusual or sensitive places. Ultimately, strategic problems in these sensitive places pose risks to policymakers. And that risk would be increased should orthodox solutions be chosen. 
So it's not a new style of thinking. The, the shifting geopolitical landscape is bringing it from the memory bank to the frontal of lobe of the mainstream Royal Navy. And I choose that final caveat very deliberately. There have, of course, been special operations delivered for many years in very discrete parts of the Royal Navy. It's the style of thinking that needs to broaden. Slide, please. Why are we doing this? Well, as we've heard, read, and perhaps experienced, the threat posed by hostile state actors or actors backed by hostile states is persistent and pernicious. What is more, terrorist threats and hostile state activity are overlapping and they're on a global scale. Operations in one region affect outcomes in another. Defence has demanded that the services increase their ability and capacity to operate in a sub-threshold space now and with persistence and set conditions to operate more effectively at the point of conflict. We must present malign, activity, malign actors multiple dilemmas, a byproduct of which may reduce the likelihood of conflict in the first place. And this links to the integrated operating concept. Special operations, therefore, are now not just the preserve of special forces, but will become core activity across all domains. They ultimately unlock critical advantage. Royal Navy analysis leads to four specific maritime special operation roles. Firstly, to understand con and constrain critical threats. This may well be in the UK EEZ, but also to tackle them closer to source. We need to introduce cost to malign activity below the threshold of conflict. As the Royal Navy, we're just a part of the system that identifies and constrains those threats. So collaboration and integration with cross Whitehall partners, as well as the other services, is absolutely fundamental. Secondly, theatre shaping to increase operational advantage now so that we can make conflict less likely. How do we do this? One way is by building relationships in specific areas and Brigadier Tony will pick this up later on. Secondly, by holding enemy capabilities at risk, whether they know we're doing this or not. And we must have the choice when to expose. To do this, we must understand their systems and where they're vulnerable. Third, prepare for future conflict. This is probably the hardest thing to do because it's the least defined. Special operations forces are rarely decisive in major combat operations, but they certainly have a role to play, perhaps with the intelligence picture, helping theater entry or contributing to deception. Right now, we're working on contingency plans, exercising and explaining what is possible. What we do know is that you cannot grow special operations capable forces at the point of conflict. It requires investment in capabilities, commanders, staff, and the sailors and Marines themselves. Fourth, crisis and contingency. For us, this centers around the waters we're interested in and our national interests at sea. For example, it may manifest as a boarding operation carrying national significance but limited tactical risk. Therefore, commando forces are being developed into the space that special forces existed, allowing us to save the highest end troops for the most demanding operations. This broadening of commando forces eases the burden on special forces. This saw commando forces on the operation to secure the MV Grace off the coast of Gibraltar. Slide please. How are we doing this? As we heard from the fleet commander, the Royal Navy's global reach and persistent forward presence mean that the service is primed to enable the special operations of others, but importantly, conduct its own special operations to service its directed military strategic objectives. We must make the Royal Navy better connected to a host of stakeholders in the UK and globally, mostly in the above secret domain. You'll have heard about every ship, a station, sensor and launch pad. This is just one of the means to be able to operate differently. 
we were effectively doing a software upgrade, if you like, of the Royal Navy to allow the Royal Navy to use its fifth, fifth generation apps. This in turn shapes the future development of those organizations that may well require our support. It's a long-term ambition and is much broader than operations. Special operations rely on special capabilities as well as those that operate them. These capabilities are being broadened from niche projects to consider a whole domain. For example, the underwater environment by specific elements of capability that work in it. And this links to multi-domain integration. I'll finish where I began. It's all underpinned by changing behaviors. Maritime special operations must become instinctive to leverage unorthodox options for the government. It's not just about how to integrate with the above secret community, but how to be interoperable with them. Education is provided to inculcate behaviors that draw maritime special operations into mainstream Royal Navy thinking. The maritime special operations concept is a way of thinking and gearing our staff functions. It is fundamentally also a catalyst for integration and of novel capability. And this I think will link to what Dr. Nina will say. Finally, it speaks to the wider Royal Navy ambition to operate differently through generating the lines of operation and capabilities needed to compete more effectively. Thank you very much. And I now hand over to um, Nina or Paul. I'll go ahead and take it from here. Thank you very much. I, um, I will say it's been exciting to listen to everyone's talks unfold in front of me. And so, um, so thanks for that. Um, so as I prepared my thoughts for today, I just, I just want to say that um, in observing all the discussions thus far, I'm exhilarated at the nuance and the clarity of the presentations I've seen to include my colleagues here, but also before. And I want to say thank you in particular to Rusi, to Sid, to Peter Roberts, to Jack Watling and others. Um, they know that I'm generally allergic to jargon dependent concepts and ideas. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know, there's a whole cottage industry in the United States among our defense thinkers and writers, simply in renaming previously um, clear and simply understood words into brand new words that are much less easily understood. Um, it's its own sport here. It's a competitive one with multi-adjective and noun matching contests. Um, so I will say like, it's just really nice um, to, to hear things done clearly. And so just for that alone, this, this, this has been an amazing morning. Uh, for me, it's the morning, right? Uh, so, um, I personally stand as a representative to the most non-translatable jargonized fields, military and cyber, and then thus I'm doubly harassed, but I don't want to let the words get in the way, I think, and, and uh, Linda Robinson already said so, right? Words can get in the way. Um, it's pretty important regardless of the lure of jargon to talk through the intersection of three different phenomena when we're talking about cyber and military applications. So first is the problem of statecraft. Um, which is what I take it we mean when we say something like persistent competition. Um, and insofar as that's the case, uh, this phenomenon that we're talking about has been around since the Treaty of Westphalia. It's an enduring one. And, and, um, and there's a long tradition of scholarship to include thinking about allies and partners, treaties, norms, and rules. All of those things apply in this, in this conversation and it's well-trod ground. Um, but then we want to contrast that with this new puzzle that both increases the space for statecraft and the tools for statecraft, and that's the cyber landscape. Um, in our case, is in this talk today, the frame of it is, is specifically the civilian maritime cyber and maritime cybersecurity landscapes. But, um, but you'll pick up pretty quickly that it's all sort of the same space. Um, here too, though, even cyber as a tool of statecraft is not entirely new. It's been ongoing and used by our special operations forces, both in joint and combined efforts, um, most of which is highly classified, um, but some of it um, is available um, and, and open source. Um, so it's not new either. It's been a shaping force for states for all of the current century and a good chunk of the last one. Um, and then the third element that I like to look at is just the evolving role of militaries within that landscape. The implications for militaries for the use of the tools of cyber for the current challenge of statecraft, and in addition to preparing militaries for their conventional role as the entity that holds the monopoly on the use of large-scale violence, and whether or not there's space in there to be doing cyber as well. 
So what is the new landscape of cyber statecraft? What is the maritime and Navy's piece of this? In simplest terms, cyber is both environment and a weapon. On the environment side, cyberspace is very challenging because it's a civilian space. With very, very few exceptions, this is the case. It is the computers, the cell phones, the Zoom, whatever this panel is. Um, it's a civilian space shot through and through. Um, within this space, we have our weapons. And for the weapons, we know that the United States and its allies hold a great deal of sophistication and are using those tools as tools of statecraft. Um, but however, so too are our adversaries, clearly so far, if you've been watching the news, as the solar winds hack that has compromised 18, I think upwards of 18,000 um, systems, that's not computers, that's entire systems, as demonstrated, our adversaries are also using these cyber tools to enhance their power and influence the United States. In addition to that problem, we also have that the fact that these, these weapons are also the tools of unstate and non-statecraft. I mean, we can ignore that at our peril, which is to say that not only is cyberspace a civilian space, but its attackers are mostly, largely, not states. And so although they have fewer resources, they lack sophistication, it doesn't mean they're unable. In many cases, it just means they're imprecise. Um, cyber weapons and the capacity to produce them are everywhere. It's, not, it's, it's an uncomfortable but true fact of this environment. And this happens within this larger landscape of competition. Um, so whether or we like to think about it or not, we have to take this into account as we think about cyber states statecraft and competition. Just the other day, by way of example, I was talking to what we refer to as an ethical hacking team. This particular ethical hacking team, ethical hackers are the ones that try and create more security by hacking. Um, I was talking to a hacking team called Sakura Samurai. And within just 10 minutes of interaction with that team, we discussed three cases of state influence, at least one of which um, that team was directly responsible for. So in the first case, for those of you um, who are familiar with the U.S. raid, uh, the raid on the U.S. Capitol last month, um, there was a there was a, a social media communications app called Parler um, that had some compromised systems that left it available for data scraping. And this young woman who is living in Austria, I believe, currently, she goes by, or at least her Twitter handle is Donk NB. Donk NB found a way to scrape all of that data, download it, and save it in preparation for and to help law enforcement to identify and capture those people who had stormed the Capitol. In a second case, we talked about Doc's current work because she is uh, intensely upset um, at the current uh, coup in Myanmar. And so what she has been doing is systematically collecting all the publicly available data to be able to show the world and, rep and to reveal the identities of those members of the coup and also to help journalists document the kinds of, of violence that is occurring currently now in, in Myanmar. And the third case I find actually the most fun, which is that the hacking team itself had discovered a series of very, um, very large government system vulnerabilities, not in the United States, but of a, of a, of a major other country's government system, its information systems. And I helped <laughs> connect them to the right people to help them reveal to that other country all of the problems they were having and how to mitigate those problems before a malicious hacker could find its way into, into their system. So three really tremendous cases of, of statecraft or non-statecraft or unstatecraft, right, that, that have nothing to do but, are, but ultimately supplement and help states and ultimately militaries do what they do. Um, so just long story short, right, so the environment is civilian and the tools are available to everyone and we have to take this seriously if we think about What's the problem? So what's the problem? What's the maritime piece? What's the, what is the Navy? And also in particular, what's SOC's piece in this? So the maritime landscape that, that to include both ports under seabed, surface water, right, is vastly underrepresented in the cyber conversation. And it, it, it concerns me, and it's one of the things that we're trying to build out on, the capacity to deploy, the capacity to supply, the capacity for nations to trade, our ports, our seabeds, the cables that run through it, the internet that we're using right now is entirely enabled by the maritime domain, not, not space, right, but the maritime domain. And that's a problem. There's also an emerging um, internet of things on the seabed. All these things must be secured and kept healthy. And all these things are fodder for the current cyber competition, for the current cyber statecraft, and for future statecraft. 
our cyber vulnerability, the global, right, our partners and allies, this shared critical infrastructure we use to communicate and talk to each other is also the one we're fighting on. And this is a very serious problem that we try to have to figure out what to figure out what to do about that. Our future and current forces want to be able to leverage sensors, suites of networks, and emerging weapons, both now and tomorrow. And those tools are, by and large, cyber dependent which means that at some point, somewhere along the way, they're either going to have their effect on a civilian system or they'll require civilian systems to be executed. So my concerns for the maritime and navies, particularly as we think through partnerships, um, are, are toward both, both the current era of competition, but also for conventional military power should we come to um, high intensity conflict. First is the problem of technological change. This is a really big Achilles heel. How do we keep up with the state of sophistication when all of the major changes to how we do cyber fighting, defend and offend are outside in the private sector? And then not only that, but how do navies then update when they update at, a, at decade by decade at best? SOF is a particularly interesting case because the, the, the pace at which they can adapt and refresh as Linda Robertson well knows, right, is phenomenal. But, but broader militaries, when we think about conventional military power, what are navies going to do with that, with that pace of technological change? Second is that the pace of learning is highly problematic. The familiarity with the tools, the kinds of contestation we do as a matter of statecraft may or may not be the same as those we do in high intensity fighting. We don't actually know. We don't know if cyber competition and the kinds of targets and the effects we're trying to have will necessarily be the same thing we're doing in high-end conflict. And we, we're waiting for those norms to emerge. And so learning how to do it is gonna be pretty incredible. Um, and then finally, the technologies we use today in competition will have effects, literal <laughs> connected technological effects on tomorrow's landscape and therefore the tools we're using. So the school, the, the tools, the skirmishes we engage in now because of the pace of change, because of the pace of learning will fundamentally change what we're doing for the future fight. And how do we, how do we, how do we acquire, how do we research, and how do we train up all of our forces to make that happen so that we can, when that, when that, when that moment arises, work effectively together. Um, so I, I, I like to think of it as effectively because we're taking the hits now, right? Our services, our cyber command, um, our domestic critical infrastructures. Our Coast Guard is doing a lot of really hard work. Um, like, how do, we, how do we defend now effectively and then also plan for tomorrow? And it's a bit like building a fire in the rain, right? So it's all coming down now and we have to imagine simultaneously what's that future architecture that will enable us. The answer so far as I can tell, um, hearkening back to my hacker team, but earlier in the conversation will be uneasy and unfamiliar partnerships in addition to well-established ones, right? So working fluidly with private sector, working fluidly with defense contractors, adjusting how we acquire, um, finding new partners and allies who have talents that, we are, that, are, uh, that are currently hidden, finding new talent pools. All of these things are gonna be part of this much larger question of how do we leverage cyber effectively in the current state of competition and prepare ourselves for the future fight. Thank you. Uh, Nina, Simon and Linda, thank you so much for, for that presentation. That, that was fascinating. Mm -hmm.